<laughs> okay, where's my clicker? Um, so, so you're a Jew. <laughs> yes, yes, that is the punchline <laughs> for, for a lot of um, European history, but especially Spain in the yeah, um, 14th, uh, 1400s, when you've had like seven centuries of this really kind of lovely, um, tolerant environment under the Muslim rulers where there's lots of poetry and the wine's really good and everybody's really getting along very well. Um, and then fucking uh, Ferdinand and Isabella get hitched um, and you're fucked. Um, so this is a um, list of practical tips if you are a uh, practicing Jewish person and you happen to find yourself in 15th century Spain uh, for how you can get along and hopefully um, keep your feet out of the fire. <laughs> Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, step one. Oh, uh, so firstly, um, who did the Inquisition persecute? Public Jews? Everyone is a good answer. Um, it was uh, after sort of people who said that they had converted to Christianity but were still secretly practicing uh, Judaism. And the reason that they were still secretly practicing Judaism is that the Christians had said, um, convert to Christianity or we'll nick all your stuff. Um, and they said, all right, <laughs> up, up with Jesus. Um, but it turns out that that's not a very effective way of getting people to believe what you believe. It's just a very effective way of getting people to want to keep their stuff. Um, so the Inquisition was, it was a way of kind of trying to f find out people who were lying. Um, there was a period of overlap when Jews were allowed to live in Spain and the Inquisition was going on. But after about 14 years, they uh, decided that the reason that all of these newly converted Christians were still doing Jewish stuff was because of the bad influence of all of the Jews who were still there, and not the fact that they had said, believe in Jesus or we'll nick all your stuff. Um, so that was when the expulsion happened, um, which, uh, as it turns out, didn't work. Uh, but, uh, so first... Thanks, I did. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Um, okay, yeah, learn to love this stuff. Um, that does not look kosher. Um, but one, one of the um, main ways that the Inquisition found out or tried to figure out who was um, keeping Jewish practice and who wasn't was through their kitchens, basically, that a lot of um, cooking staff ratted on their households. Um, so that's why a lot of um, Sephardic, which means Spanish Jewish cooking, involves olive oil instead of the um, pork fat that's in all other kinds of Spanish cooking. Um, in, for um, Spanish Christians in the 16th century, the reason that um, when you go to Spain now there's pork in everything is basically because they were culturally trying to just, like they had this obsession with trying to suss out all of these secret Jews and secret Muslims. And so their like, pork eating in public became almost this, like, this kind of cult thing. That everyone was like, how is your bacon? It's delicious, neighbor. How is your sausage? Um, so in order to... <laughs> God, I didn't even mean that as a dick joke. It's just like, <laughs> Anton's just like this. <laughs> so, uh, in order to participate in that, but still relatively try to keep kosher, isn't that clever? Um, they would cure, so this is goose um, or duck, um, and they would cure it in salt so it came out looking like the color of bacon or of hamon. Um, and then they sit out there, basically, I don't know, they had a table in front of their houses being like, this is delicious bacon, oh, sure is, sure had a snout when it was alive. <laughs> yes, sirree. Um, and they, there's also a kind of uh, sausage that they made out of chicken and beef that it was intended to look exactly like a pork sausage. Um, so, pork sausage. <laughs> uh, good, so yeah, learn how to cure uh, goose breast so it looks like pig is uh, numero uno. Go to church. Um, obviously, that's a big one if you're pretending to adhere to a, a group religion that you don't actually. It's a good idea to do it in public. But there's a twist. Yes, even when you're menstruating. Um, there was a... <laughs> sorry, can I just say that the level of, like, PowerPoint ability has dropped drastically in the last act of this. Um, there was a couple that was dobbed in because someone overheard them talking about whether or not um, she should go to church even though she was menstruating. Uh, and the reason that that was a red... 
red flag. <laughs> Uh, is that, that you, you, it, you wouldn't go to synagogue when you were menstruating if you were uh, Jewish because um, w women who are menstruating are ritually not clean, um, which is not a phrase that I like to use because it's not to do with cleanliness in the sense of like women being icky. It's, the, it's, it's to do with like, r religious who can and can't do things. Um, but <laughs> what I like about this was that it's entirely possible that the woman was just like, I don't fucking want to get up on a Sunday morning when I'm on my period. I don't want to get up on a Sunday morning when I'm on my period. Um, especially when you know like women at church, like all those bitches are going to be judging you and like the way that your mantilla hangs and if you like a little peaky. Um, so that's key. Uh, related to that, don't smell very good. Um, because... Here is a list of all of the times that, um, ideally, if you were observantly Jewish, you would take a bath. Uh, Fridays before Shabbat, so you're clean going in. Um, ditto festivals, and this is um, like Purim, uh, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, uh, Pesach, Sikhat, which are throughout the year. So not only is it weekly, but there's also these which are happening throughout the week. Um, every time after you've finished menstruating, um, likewise, um, if you have uh, semen come out of you, um, that puts you into a state of ritual impurity, so you have to take a bath um, before you get married and after you give birth, uh, which is quite a lot. Um, and they have, there's, there's communal baths, so that there's a place for everyone, everyone who's Jewish to go do that. Um, so you're not smelling too peaky. Um, this is when, um, religiously, an observant Christian is encouraged to take a bath. <laughs> um, obviously, people are bathing more than that, but it's not as regular and it's not as ritualized, so it's not as... You, you don't definitely smell good, you just might smell good. Good. Um, don't change clothes on Friday, that's quite an important one. Uh, anything that signifies that you are making a difference between Friday daytime and Friday after sundown uh, indicates that you might be observing Shabbat, um, which is a no-no, so no like putting on makeup in the office toilets um, after work. Um, and if you uh, want to really, really, really make sure that you make it through, uh, you do my favorite uh, coping tactic, uh, which is that you check it all and become a pirate. <laughs> Once the expulsion order was signed in 1492, there was a quite big chunk of um, Jewish people who basically said, like, fine, like, fuck off and fuck you. Um, and they went to Holland, which was Spain's enemy because it was broadly Protestant, and they went to Morocco, which was Spain's enemy because it was full of a bunch of Muslim people who um, had good reason to be pissed off at Spain. Um, and they got a bunch of ships, and they started, um, like, just actually focusing on attacking Spanish trade routes um, because they were so pissed off at Spain, and rightly so. Um, this is my favorite. Uh, John Lafitte is probably a, a pirate who you will have heard of who is descended from Jewish people. Um, the, the most famous pirate has this great name, um, Moses Cohen Enriquez, which I just love. It sounds like a punchline, but it's real. <laughs> my other favorite Jewish pirate was this guy who... Um, his name was Shmuel, and he was a pirate, but he was also a rabbi. Um, and so he literally, he, like, he was a rabbi first because his dad had been a rabbi, and then they were kicked out of Spain. Uh, and then he's like, fuck it, I'm gonna go get a pirate ship. I am so angry. Um, and then he got lots of money, and he, he went to Holland, and he started a congregation there. Um, and then about 10 years later, he's like, I'm still angry. Um, so he went, and he got a, a ship, and then he did it again. Then he come back and, and built up this really good synagogue there. And he kept doing this every kind of uh, seven to 10 years um, into his 70s. So we can picture like this old rabbi um, captaining a pirate ship. Uh, just like, fuck you, Spain! <laughs> What, what I also like is that um, a very common um, icon of Jewish pirates at the time was the phoenix that they would put on their um, ships because it was um, like a bird that's literally kind of rising out of the ashes. Um, so it's really, it's targeted at, at the Inquisition just as a sort of... <laughs> um, this is really interesting to me because it's, um, I don't know how well you can see, but it's... Um, a lexicon that was published in the Caribbean in the 1770s, uh, and it's ship terms, and they're translations in Spanish and in Hebrew, um, which kind of shows that those are the languages that are spoken by a lot of sailors there, and it's the Caribbean, and there happen to be pirates there. Um, so th this is how uh, sort of common this was, and how many there were in this group of people, that this is a, a necessary vocabulary list. Um, and that's the thing that 
No one expected. 